as a 16 year old student uh, here in high school, junior in high school, and uh, she is a, a person who was born in the United States, but her parents emigrated to the United States from Mexico. Jessica maintains a very, very close relationship with her family, uh, her father especially, who is a contractor, and her mother, who is a stay-at-home mom because she has two siblings, younger brothers four and eight, whom Jessica also helps care for, uh, and her mom, uh, who, who uh, cares for her and, and is a very nurturing person, very tight-knit family. The reason for this consultation is that uh, the sexual assault occurred at a party and that she's been, ever since this uh, assault, experiencing a great deal of anxiety and sadness. And uh, normally, as she had been done, doing very, very well in school in the top 10% of her high school class, but since this assault, she's found it very difficult to concentrate. Uh, her grades have begun to show uh, the effect of that. She's shutting down and can't remember periods of time uh, where the, she's blocked out. Uh, of great concern is that she's begun to cut on her arms and on her legs. Um, Jessica's family, and I think this is important in light of the topic of this module, is a very close-knit, conservative, socially conservative Catholic family, and uh, she's very close with them. And they have, uh, this relationship that she has with her father is one of intense protectiveness on his part. He's, he's someone who has commented to her recently as a young woman that she doesn't seem to be dressing appropriately, that she um, is, is missing curfews. Uh, in fact, he made a comment to her recently that the manner in which she dressed made her look like a prostitute and that she was asking for something bad to happen. Well, Jessica has stated to the uh, previous consultation, in the previous consultation, that she, ever since she, she's uh, been assaulted, she hears this comment that her father made to her again and again in her mind. Um, Jessica's mother, as I said, is very nurturing, but uh, Jessica is concerned that uh, because of the degree of nurturance and intimacy that they have, that her mom would, would not be able to cope with the fact uh, uh, of a traumatic sexual assault that she experienced, and so she's reluctant to tell her mom, and she's very reluctant to tell her father. Uh, she has an extended, uh, close-knit extended family as well, and especially she has a bunch of relatives still residing in Mexico. One of her relatives, a cousin, uh, was sexually assaulted a few years ago at the age of 18 when she went out to a club in Mexico. And most of her family over uh, in Mexico had been very supportive of, of uh, the cousin, yet some of the family members, Jessica is aware, had actually not been very supportive and had criticized her about exaggerating the nature of the assault, and others felt like she brought the sexual assault on herself, which is a common theme that we hear in blaming the victim. Um, some of the additional facts that might be pertinent to understanding this next session are that uh, in the first interview she was very anxious. Uh, as I said, her, her uh, greatest fear is confronting this fact of her assault with her parents. Uh, she also has had some uh, panic attacks uh, associated with this trauma. Most recently, she saw someone at a shopping mall who looked like the perpetrator, and so she found herself, after that um, event, crying in the bathroom in the mall. Um, the, the issue of cutting uh, is she recognizes not a, not a healthy way of coping with her stress and, and the traumatic events, uh, but at the same time, she doesn't know quite how to cope with this. She's also quite worried about her academic success because she was planning on going to the university after she gets out of high school. And she's really lost a lot of the sense of pride and resilience for which she has uh, typically been known. Uh, she's experiencing, according to her intake diagnosis, acute stress disorder. Her symptoms appear to be a sense of dissociation and depersonalization associated um, with this traumatic experience. And as I said, uh, she has been involved in cutting. Um, she has avoided uh, certain places and people. Uh, so we see some associated issues uh, of uh, traumatic stress. And uh, she's trying to contain these intense feelings and learn how to cope with these intense feelings that she has surrounding her assault. So now we're going to hear from um, Jessica, the client, and her therapist, Dr. McCormick. 
Jessica? Yes. Hi, I'm Adam McCormick. Hi. Good to meet you. Come on in. Yes. Come on in. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any trouble finding the place? No. Okay. Good. Good. Oftentimes we have some some folks who have trouble finding it. So, um, so I understand this was your idea to, to to come talk to me. And I have to say we don't have too many sixteen year old kids who seek out um, counseling. So tell me a little bit about about what's going on and why you wanted to see me. Um. I I was recently. Um, sexually assaulted at a, a party that I went to um, and I'm scared um, I'm, I'm really afraid to tell my parents okay okay and I know that I have to because it's bothering me and it's affecting me in so many ways sure sure I can imagine that's incredibly difficult to deal with but especially difficult to deal with alone. Um, have, have you talked about it with anyone else? Um, no. 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 Okay. So tell me a little bit about why um, you haven't told your parents. Um, I mean, I was out doing things that I wasn't supposed to be doing. Um, my dad told me not to um, to go to these places and to dress the way that I was dressing, and I. I did it anyways, and I didn't listen to him, and it happened to me, and I can't believe it. Yeah, I, I can imagine that's, that's really difficult. When you say that you were out at these places doing things that you weren't supposed to be doing, what do you mean? Um, I tried to fit in with my friends and go to parties and dress the way that they dress, and, and my dad told me that's not the way that a lady should dress. And I didn't listen, and I went, and it, and I got the attention that he said I would get. Okay, okay. Um, it sounds like one of the the issues that what, what I'm hearing you say one of the one of the big issues is your your dad had maybe made some comments about the way that you dress, and you feel like maybe that has something to do with why this this bad thing happened to you. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. When we've had arguments about it, or when he's talked to me about it, um, it really hurt my feelings because he said that I look like a prostitute. And when this happened to me, I, I think that's how I was treated. I was treated like a prostitute. Okay. So what, what I'm hearing you say is um, this bad thing happened to you um, at this party one night. Um, and Dad had made some comments previously about how wearing these clothes or going to these places could potentially be an invitation for this to happen, and that's keeping you from talking to your dad about this. Yeah. I know he's going to be mad, and he's going to be ashamed of me and disappointed. Yeah. Why do you think he's going to be mad? Because that's not like me. It was never like me to do that before. I never would have done that before. So talk about, you say that's not like you. What, what, what would be like you? He was always proud of me. Me and my dad are very close. He was always telling me that he expected a lot from me. And I, I have two younger brothers that look up to me. And he's always telling me that they want to be just like me. And they want to be good students like me. And... And I have so many opportunities, you know, after high school, and I think all of that has just gone out the window. Okay, okay. Um, tell me a little bit more about when you say this has gone out the window. What do you What do you mean by that? I think if I if I tell them or if people know, I'm not going to be like that anymore. They're not going to see me as a role model for my brothers and and the one in my family that went to college and the one that got the good grades and I'm not going to be the good girl anymore. How do you think they're going to see you? Like my dad said, I'm going to be seen like a prostitute or I'm going to be disrespected everywhere that I go. Okay. So when you say you're not going to be seen like the good girl um, anymore, why do you feel that way? 
because I did things that I wasn't supposed to do and and I didn't listen and my grades are already getting bad and everything's just going downhill. It's just too much. So your grades have dropped since this happened. How long ago was this that this happened? This happened two months ago. Okay. So your grades struggling a little bit at school. Yes. And it sounds like historically you've been a pretty good student. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me s start by saying it. it's incredibly courageous that you're here today, that you're, you came and, and talked to me. I think it says a lot about you um, and what you're going through in terms of dealing with this alone. Tell me a little bit about what it's been like to deal with this alone. It's been so hard. It's been hard because I can't concentrate on anything else. All I think about is, is my parents and their disappointment. I can't tell my friends because I think they're just going to think that I'm lying. Um, I can't go anywhere. I feel like I'm scared. I'm scared to be alone if I go to the mall or I'm scared. Um, and it's just too much to handle. Sure, sure. Just overwhelming. It is. It sounds like. Yeah, yeah. So when you get overwhelmed um, with that, you know, being scared, as you said, and just this anxiety and nervousness about talking to your parents, I mean, what does that kind of look like for you? I just prefer to stay home. I prefer to stay in my room and just not talk to anyone else. Yeah. And I, I started to cut on my arms. Yeah. It just takes everything away and I don't, I don't feel so bad anymore. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like there are some major barriers that you perceive could potentially exist if, with telling your parents or them finding out about this. And we'll certainly talk about those. But let's imagine for a second that you do tell them. Let's imagine that their response or reaction is maybe a little bit more positive than what you know, you've, you've kind of imagined it would be, you've thought about what, what it would be. How do you think things would be different for you in terms of dealing with this and processing this with your parents or your family? If it was a good outcome? Yeah, if it, maybe if it was a little more positive than you, than you think. I think, I think I can have more courage and I think that I'd feel better about school and I think I would feel a little more respect for myself. Okay. So do you think that maybe some of the things that dad said previously about the clothes that you wear and the, and the, the places that you go, I mean, do you, do you feel like that's causing you to not be able to respect yourself after this happened? Yeah. Yeah. Help me understand a little bit more about the how, how so. I I think I've always considered myself to be very conservative, mm -hmm. and uh, you know my family's Catholic, and and they've taught me that you know of ways that a lady should act, and they've taught they've they've taught me all those things, and I feel like. I lost it. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like the little girl that they knew before. Yeah, yeah. What do you think needs to happen for you to feel like that little girl again? I think if, if, if I can talk to them and they can let me know that they're still proud of me, I can feel better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned before that, you know, it would take a lot of courage for you to to talk to them and to deal with this. Um, have, do you feel like historically you've been a pretty courageous person? I think so, yeah. Okay. How so? In what ways? Are there examples of anything in I've, particular? I've always been able to talk to them and I've always, you know, um, we have good relationships. Any problems that I have in school or with my friends or my girlfriends, they're there to talk with me about, but with this, this is different. I don't, I don't, I don't know how my mom can handle this. I don't know what my dad will do. Yeah, yeah. 
What makes this so different? Because of what happened to me, I feel like my father will think that that this man took away my innocence. Okay. Okay. And I don't think my mom can handle that. Yeah. So it's what I'm hearing you say, maybe it's going to be too overwhelming for mom yeah. and potential for dad to feel like um, your innocence has been taken from you and this possibility that you feel like he's going to feel that in some way that you've invited this. Yeah. That, do you think there's a chance that they might have a different response? They might. My cousin went through this and my parents were supportive of her when other family members weren't. Yeah. But I'm their daughter. I don't know if it's going to be different. Sure, sure. Tell me a little bit about, you said they were supportive of your your cousin. What did that look like? My mom um, would talk with her. My mom would put her arm around her, you know, and hug her and cry with her when she needed that. And, and, you know, my dad didn't treat her any different. Mm -hmm. But her dad would be angry and he would be punching things and he wanted to do bad things to the man yeah. that did that to her. And I'm afraid that that's what my dad is going to do. Sure. So he was really kind of protective yeah. of her and you feel like there's possibility that dad, your dad, mm-hmm. may be the same way. Yeah. yeah. Is, he, is he historically been a pretty protective dad? Yes. Talk about that. What has that been like? Um, well, like I said, you know, we're, we're Catholic and he's very... Um, strong on you know the belief that we need to take care of ourselves as women and that we need to respect ourselves and dress appropriately and and you know even with that he's been very you know he's shown me a different side when he talks to me about how I dress I see the anger I see the protection that he's trying to give me and I can't imagine how he would react if I tell him about this What is kind of the reaction or the emotion that he tends to lead with when you come to him with something difficult to work? Well, he's always supportive. Okay. With with other things. It, there's never been anything this bad, but with this, I think he would just feel angry, and I think he would probably get violent or maybe... I, I, I have no idea what he would do. So you say he's going to be angry. Angry at who? With, with, with the man that did this to me. Sure. Okay. Do you think that's a pretty normal reaction for a father to have? Yeah. yeah. But you're just kind of saying maybe it's going to be so much anger or frustration. Yeah. That and I don't know if he can forgive me. Forgive you. Do you feel like you need to be forgiven for anything? Oh, I don't think that I asked for this, but my dad would always tell me that I was dressing like if I was. Yeah. What do you think his intentions were when he made those comments about the way you dress? Well, I think he was just trying to keep me safe. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do you think that young ladies or girls who dress a certain way are inviting or putting themselves at risk or um, at any way responsible for when these bad things, sexual assault or stuff like that happens? I don't think that it's their fault when it does happen. Yeah. And all my friends dress like this and sure. nothing's happened to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's imagine that there was a, another 16, 17 year old young lady that experienced kind of what you've experienced here. Um, and maybe she's having some of the same feelings as you. Maybe her relationship with her father, you know, is very similar to that with your father, very protective. Um, but maybe he's also made some comments about the clothing and, and, and that type of stuff. What kind of advice do you think you would give her? What would you tell her? If this happened to her, that it's not her fault. Sure. And that she does need to talk about it. Yeah. Good. 
because it's hard to keep it inside. It's really hard, and I, I wouldn't want that for anybody else. Absolutely. I think that'd be good advice for her. Let's imagine your dad was having that same conversation with that same 16-year-old girl, 17-year-old girl. What do you think he would say? If it were my dad, I think he would be caring, and I think he would show her support, and he would hug her and be there for her. Mm -hmm. I think my dad would do that. Sure, sure. So do you think he would be able to kind of begin by seeing what the consequences are of this awful thing that happened, be able to identify with the emotions that she's experienced in terms of the pain and, and the sadness and the fear and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't think you would want her to feel that way. Sure. I think you would want to be there yeah. for her. Yeah. So with you, I mean, you, you've said that it's a little different with you because it's your father, he's very protective. You guys have kind of had this ongoing feud about clothes and where you go and, and that kind of stuff, all normal teenage stuff. I'm sure all the same stuff that your friends are dealing with with many of their fathers and parents. Um, is that right? Um, yeah. but you said it's going to be a little bit different. Do you think with you that your dad would be able to begin by looking at the pain and, and, and the sadness and the fear that you've been dealing with before he looked at some of the other stuff that you were kind of afraid of? Yeah, I definitely think he could. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So how are you feeling about potentially talking to him in particular? We'll move on to mom. Next, what, what are you? Where are you at with, with talking to Dad? Well, now that we've used that example, I have, I have an idea in my head that that he may be supportive in the way that I need him to be right now. Yeah. But do you still have a little bit of concern or fear that he might? Ascribe some blame to you? I'm nervous, yeah. Sure. Of, you know, I told you so. Yeah. I'm a little afraid of that. Sure. But I don't think I... I think I prefer his support. Okay. Yeah. So let's imagine that you do have that conversation and, you know, he's very supportive and, and loving and very nurturing but very protective as well. And maybe in the context of that, let's imagine that he does make some comments about, um, you know, I told you so, or I told you not to dress that, or I told you not to go to those places. I mean, how do you think you, you would handle that? What would that look like for you? I think I can handle that because he's being supportive. Okay. I think all I care about right now is just being able to talk to them about it. Yeah. And I know that he's just being a parent when he tells me those things. Okay. I know that he's just worrying about me. Sure. Yeah. But I think I can handle it. So what I hear you saying is you feel like you'd be able to identify maybe some of the strengths in, in, in why he might have that reaction. Yeah. At the same time, I mean, are you able to kind of externalize her to, to, um, to be able to recognize that even if he says that, that this bad thing that happened to you had absolutely nothing to do with you, that you're not at all responsible for that. Yeah. You are able to do that? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about mom. You said, you, you said initially that you just feel like it would just be too overwhelming for mom to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your relationship and why you think that. Um, my mom is the softer one. Okay. She's more emotional. She's more, she's always worried. Okay. And I'm afraid that if I tell her, this will just be too much for her. And she did everything, you know, by the book. She did everything that she was supposed to do. She got married first and, you know, by the church and... And I feel like she's she's gonna be worried about about my womanhood or my childhood or okay. things yeah. like that. Yeah. 
So, I mean, essentially, mom has done everything just right as a parent. Done everything that she could in terms of showing love and nurture and supporting you all. But this bad thing happened. Uh, no fault of yours, no fault of hers. Um, all the fault of this this other person, right? Um, what do you tell her in that circumstance where she's feeling that way? That, you know, I, I feel like I did everything right. I've been a good mom. I've been loving and nurturing and supportive. But yet this bad thing happened, and I ultimately feel some level of responsibility for it. But what do you tell I don't, her? I don't want her to feel like that. Yeah. She did everything that she was supposed to. She took care of me. She's always been there for me. Yeah. I don't want her to feel that at all. Okay. She's a good mom. Good. 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 And I don't want her to feel hurt. Yeah. What do you think her reaction to that would be? If you tell her that? I think at first she would probably cry a lot. I think she would have wanted to be there for me. Okay. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, you you alluded to that a little bit with your father as well. Um, so here you've gone two months and you haven't told him, and it sounds like uh, there's good reason why you haven't. And, and you've dealt with this on your own, which has been incredibly courageous, but I would imagine also incredibly difficult and lonely. Um, why do you think they would want to know and be there for you and support you in this? What would be so important to them? My mom would hate the fact that I've been going through this alone. She she wouldn't want me to. Sure. Especially after she knows, you know, how I've been handling it. She would have wanted to be there yeah. for me. Okay. Yeah. So although it might be overwhelming, although it might be difficult to hear, although she may experience some level of responsibility for it, ultimately you think she would want to know and want to process it and, and be there and support you as you're dealing with this. I think so. Yeah. yeah. What does that say about your parents, do you think? That they love me and they care a lot about me no matter what happens. No matter what I did, no matter if I didn't listen, sure. they would still be there for me. Yeah. And so they love me. So that, that love and that concern and that care for you is going to um, kind of take precedent over any of these kind of secondary concerns or issues or other stuff that kind of kept you from talking to them about that. I think that would come first. Good, good, good. So let's imagine we're having this conversation with them. I mean, ultimately, or you're having this conversation with them. Um, what would you ultimately hope that that would look like? How would it happen? Where would it happen? Who would be there? I think it would just be between us three. Sure. I wouldn't want my brothers to know or hear about it. They're too young. Um, I imagined this happening at home at the dinner table where we always have our conversations and any time that, you know, we have something serious to talk about, it happens there. Okay. Good, good. Um, you, you touched a little bit on your father feeling like um, uh, that, you know, you're, you're his little girl and that mm -hmm. somehow this would have kind of changed that uh, in some ways, that maybe uh, you've done something that he can't be proud of you anymore. Um, do you feel like your father can still be proud of you? I do. They have so many expectations of me and they wanted me to do so many things and I think I still can. Mm -hmm. I think I still can. I just, I still need their help. Yeah. I still want to go to college. I still want to do all those things and... I just, I can't do it alone anymore. Sure, sure. Um, you, you touched a little bit on the fact that, uh, you know, your grades have slipped a little bit. Um, you know, reading through um, some of the stuff that you submitted, you, you've been at the top of your class, you've got plans of going away uh, to college. And you know, a couple times in here, you kind of alluded to that slipping away or, or um, almost like that's not a 
possibility anymore. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I always concentrate at school and I'm always focused and and now when I'm in class, sometimes I miss the whole thing. I miss the whole class. I don't remember any of it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So I'm afraid that I'm not learning the way that I need to learn. And, and when I take tests, they're not any good anymore. Okay. So just, just not cut yourself in terms of your yeah. ability to focus and, and pay attention. Um, Sure, sure. And that's something that we can definitely work on, um, uh, you know, assuming that you might want to come back and keep working through this. Um, but I, I, I think you, you've touched on a really important thing in terms of not dealing with this alone. Um, and so where are you at in terms of, you know, the thought of kind of working through this with, with your family? I think I would, I think I need to talk to them about it. Sure. and talking about the ways that it might go helps a little bit. Okay. Um, I kind of picture it a little bit different now. So I think I need to talk to them. Okay, yeah. Um, you've, you've touched a lot on um, the issue of courage. And, and, and bravery and that kind of stuff. And I think it's evident, obvious, that you have a lot of courage and a lot of bravery and a lot of resilience. And I know, you know, throughout your life, you've, you've kind of shown that that resilience in terms of being at the top of your class, being such a good sibling, being such a good daughter. Um, and, and, and there's no question that you are all of those things. But I think you coming here uh, shows a lot of courage and you coming to talk and, and seeking this out. There aren't a lot of 16-year-old kids, 17-year-old kids who who do that. And I think it shows a lot of insight and, and a lot of resiliency and a lot of courage. Um, and I think telling your parents and sitting down and having that conversation at the dinner table um, shows a, a lot of courage as well. So when you do decide to have that conversation, it sounds like you might be wanting to do that pretty soon. Uh, just remind yourself that it's incredibly courageous and you're very brave for doing that. Um, so I think we'll end, end there uh, on, on that courage and that, that bravery. Um, and I, I look forward to, to visiting with you next week and hearing how that goes. Are, are you feeling ready for that conversation? I don't think I am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, good. So I will, um, I'll see you next week and uh, we'll kind of process how things went. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, we just saw a scenario between Dr. Adam McCormick as the therapist and Elsie Munoz playing the role of Jessica Lopez, a client who had experienced a sexual assault a couple months back. Um, like in other sessions that we've recorded and discussed, the purpose of this particular session is to tie back to the themes of this module in that when we're working with people who are Hispanic, we have to look from the point of view of their strengths, their resilience, their assets, rather than from their deficits. There has been a tendency, which we repudiate completely in the School of Social Work here at UTEP, to impute uh, negative uh, deficit models on uh, people of color minorities. In fact, we take the opposite approach, which is that the ethnicity, in this case Hispanic and in specific to this particular client, conservative, socially conservative Catholic Mexican uh, American, is in fact full of protective features which work to mediate the kind of extreme trauma that she went through as a result of this sexual assault for which she has absolutely no blame at all. So the session went uh, with that in the background and then also focusing in on what kinds of strengths that she might bring with respect to her culture and in this case family being the foundation of Hispanic culture through familismo we saw that Dr. McCormick was building very carefully toward uh, re-establishing that connection that, that Jessica felt that she had lost as a result of what her father predicted uh, were her irresponsible 
actions by manner of dress and behavior, which then elicited, presumably in his mind, an assault, which now I think at the end of the session, Jessica's probably going to be, be thinking about this very, very differently. In fact, Jessica left this session very different position than when she came in. She came in, she was racked with guilt, she was shamed, she felt alone, uh, isolated, she hadn't talked about this with anybody, and when she left, she was already had begun to rehearse in her mind various scenarios about how she might confront this issue with her dad and with her mom. And by virtue of, I thought, very skillful probing and questioning, uh, Adam led her to this sort of a realization of the kinds of things that work in her favor. Uh, for instance, he affirmed again uh, and again uh, that she was a courageous person for having first come to her and revealed this intimate secret that, about which she felt so much shame and uh, that led her later to reaffirm her strength in being able to con perhaps confront her dad or talk to her dad about, about what had happened. There, there, there's a tendency um, in, in Hispanic families, we've seen in our own practice in, the, in this community, to rally around teenagers when they're in a, in a, in a situation where they're troubled. Um, I'll give you an example that's very common uh, in, in the border region where we work, and that is when a, 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 a teenage uh, woman has an unplanned pregnancy uh, outside of a, a stable relationship, um, often that's a shock to the system because of traditional social values and Catholicism of, of, of monogamy or chastity and what have you. And, and yet we see again and again people rally around the teenage daughter and give her that sort of a welcoming place and the baby, when the baby comes into the world, is loved with complete and total acceptance and affection. Um, so the, the notion that I'm going to be shamed by virtue of having a child out of wedlock that was unplanned as a girl in high school or that I'm going to be shamed uh, by virtue of have been assaulted by somebody in a situation that was not of my own making, I think it, that deficit sort of thinking is being turned around in, in the session that, that Adam uh, did. Um, near, the, near the end of the, uh, of the session, Dr. McCormick was asking key sorts of questions about how she might imagine her father actually rallying to her support instead of casting aspersions on her and, and saying, how did you get into this situation? And leading her to a recognition that in fact she has historically very, very loving parents who have always rallied behind her. And she realizes that when her dad was making this sort of awful statement that her manner of dress made her look like a prostitute, that he was just being a parent, maybe not the best choice of words, but he was just being a parent and he told me those things because he was interested in my safety and he's very protective of me. Um, I think she walked out of the room hearing some words in the echoing in her mind that uh, Adam pointed to again and again, her courage, her strength, and her resilience. And this is something that we need to echo again and again with sessions with people that they are able to recover and they have the resources within themselves to recover, but especially when they're embedded in a family and a community as this young woman is. And so turning to her assets, her cultural assets are this extended family that has been very, very supportive of her and her cousin uh, when the similar thing happened with her cousin. Would you like to tell us anything about what was going on in your mind as you were rallying this uh, client toward these realizations? Sure, sure. I think initially when, when she started talking about um, you know what she was going through, um, just like any social worker, I wanted to kind of prioritize what, you know, what do we need to start with? What, what are the most important things to address? And it was evident right away that the two things that I wanted to address is her processing this and dealing with this alone. Just knowing kind of from a trauma-informed perspective, a 16-year-old kid dealing with this awful sexual assault alone. Um, so, you know, certainly my, my goal was to see, you know, is, is there any capacity for the family to handle this? And as she was discussing more, some of the elements of her family, the, the love and the protection and, and those things, it was evident, you know, these 
seem like, you know, although there are these barriers there, you know, based on some of the things that, that she mentioned, that some of the comments that her father had previously made, um, you know, my hunch was that they were going to be supportive and loving, and, and, and that's where they were going to start. Um, and the other kind of top priority was to address that cognitive distortion of, um, you know, her feeling some sense of blame, some sense of responsibility for this. So kind of more from a kind of feminist theoretical perspective, you know, let's look at, um, you know, let's make it very clear that that's not the case and to ask questions for her to process that. And I was pretty comfortable that, that she was, you know, a little bit more, more, um, a little better able to, to, to process that and, and, and recognize the fact that, um, you know, she wasn't in blame. You know, with more time, um, in assuming that I would have a lot more time with her, you know, it's obvious that processing the trauma, working through this awful thing that happened to her, um, focusing more on the individual aspects would have been, you know, very important to, to look at over a long period of time. But immediately, um, I wanted to see if there was any potential for her to process this and, and to talk about this with someone else. And it was evident that that certainly was um, probably going to be a possibility. So I just wanted to explore, um, you know, we know kids who experience trauma, kids who experience things like sexual assault, physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, oftentimes focus on those negative thoughts and those negative cognitive distortions where they take a life of their own. And it was evident that these comments that her father made about her, her dress and inviting these bad things to happen to her have kind of taken a life of their own. So I wanted to process that, work through that, help her to recognize, one, where those comments come from. And I agree with you, Mark. I mean, they were wildly inappropriate comments and, and not beneficial in, in any context to say that to a young woman, but at the same time for her to recognize maybe where that's coming from, that it is coming from a place of love and protection, uh, you know, even if it's, you know, clearly created some real barriers to um, her dealing with this bad thing that, that, that happened to her. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking. Let, let's tease out the elements, the strengths in this family, why it's so important for her to talk about that and to do it in a way that she's able to process that and make those determinations without me just sitting down and saying, I really think you need to talk to your parents about this and here's why. And we know that's not going to be effective um, at all. So um, those are what, what I really hope to do. And the other thing that I really hope to do, which I didn't think I did a good enough job, was, was looking at her resilience um, and um, some of the more interpersonal stuff in terms of her capacity to deal with this. Um, you know, I focused a little bit on, you know, the courage and the trust, but I wish, you know, with a little bit more time, I would have focused on some of that resilience and how she's been so successful, how she's been so resilient, such a good daughter, such a good sister, such a good student, um, and then try to incorporate that into this conversation that she's going to have with her parents. Uh, one of the more poignant moments was when you said, do you think your father could still be proud of you? And um, Jessica, I could see light bulbs going on uh, in her head that she was reconnecting with the thought that indeed her father could in fact be proud of her and would likely still be proud of her as he has in the past. Um, and while she might have been concerned at an exaggerated level early on about his level of anger, um, probably I think at this point she, she was beginning to realize that the loving kind of support that's been her experience as a, as a girl in this family growing up now to be a young woman is probably going to prevail and that's what she walked away with. ¿Hay algo que quisiera añadir, doctora? Pues, uh, este es un excelente ejemplo de la importancia de reencuadrar las uh, valores culturales como es la comunidad, el marianismo, el machismo, el familismo, el respeto y el orgullo. Sí. Como eh, si lo manejo con eh, distorsión cognitiva, me puede, puedo sentir que me está haciendo daño y ah, cuando se trabaja como terapeuta, puedo hacer el reencuadre y esto volver, llevarlo a la resiliencia, a sanar. Muy bien. Uh, I hope this has been beneficial because I think it's very important that we start looking at the strengths and resilience, even in a situation as traumatic as a, as a sexual assault. Thanks.